it's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the OSD on-screen display menu system of the Gigabyte G32QC. The OSD is controlled by a joystick at the rear of the monitor towards the right side, as viewed from in front. If you twiddle that up, down, left or right before you've actually pressed it in, you can activate various different settings, they're called Quick Switch, and I'll go through them in the main menu system when I get there. If you press the joystick in, it comes up with this little radial menu, so you can see to the left there's dashboard, to the right there's game assist, down is power off, and up is setting. Alternatively, if you hold the joystick in for a few seconds, it'll power the monitor off, so that's another way you can do that. To use the dashboard feature, you have to be using the OSD Sidekick software, so I'll show you that towards the end of the review. The game assist settings, they have a few different options, so there's game info, game timer, count up and count down. So this gives you a little timer on the screen towards the top right there. And if you select count down, you can set the time that it'll count down from. So it's set to five minutes at the moment, but you can set that to anywhere up to 99 minutes. There's gaming counter. And what this does is it'll count up every time you press certain buttons, and you can figure that as a hotkey in the OSD Sidekick software, which I'll show you shortly. Next is refresh rate, and if you're using Adaptive Sync, so you've got FreeSync active on the monitor in the OSD, and you're using Adaptive Sync with your system or GPU, and you're within the variable refresh rate window, then this will show you the frame rate of the content, whereas if you're using a static refresh rate, it'll just show you that, so 165 hertz at the moment. So it's saying 165 frames a second. You can see I've also got the other features there. You don't have to have them all on screen at the same time. You can just pick one of them or two of them or all three, as I've got here. Info location that allows you to select where you actually want this to appear. So I could have it either the top left, the top right, the bottom left, the bottom right, or the left side central region or right side central region. So I've got it at the right side central region at the moment. So now you can see the refresh rate displayed there. Next is an on-screen crosshair, style 1, custom 1, custom 2, and custom 3. And these custom ones, they are configured in the OSD Sidekick software, which again I'll show you a bit later. So the standard style is just this green cross here, so that's displayed in the center of the screen there at the moment. There is then a display alignment feature, so this will give you some guidelines to help you line up multiple monitors. So if I go up to setting, that will get me to the main menu. So the layout and feature set is very similar to the Aorus models, except there's the blue color instead of orange, just a slight distinction there. But you can see a few things at the top. It'll quickly give you references to various different settings there. And that changes depending on where on the menu you are. So for example, if you go into picture, it displays various other things there. So there's aim stabilizer at the top there. That's grayed out at the moment. That's because you can't use that whilst you've got AMD FreeSync Premium Pro active in the OSD. So in other words, you can't have it active when you're using Adaptive Sync. So when I activate this, the screen will start to flicker and you'll see that in the video, but that's really all you'll see. But this feature is explored in the review, in the written review. It's a strobe backlight setting. So the screen is now flickering or strobing at a frequency matching the refresh rate of the display, so 165 hertz in this case. You can also use it at 144 hertz or 120 hertz. By default, 144 hertz is only available via HDMI, and 165 hertz will only ever be available by DisplayPort, but you can set a custom resolution of 144 hertz when using DisplayPort if you'd like. Next is Black Equalizer, and that's set to 10 by default. If you raise this, it will significantly raise the detail for dark areas. It's designed to give you a competitive edge in games and that kind of thing, but it also increases the black point quite significantly, so it does decrease the contrast, and even increasing that just 1 to 11 gives a fairly flooded look, but the main purpose is to give you a competitive edge, and that's just set to 11. You can set that all the way up to 20 if you'd like, and that really brightens things up an awful lot. By 20, things look extremely flooded, and I actually think that's gone far too far, even 
in terms of giving you a competitive edge, but you can adjust that according to your preferences if you'd like. You can also reduce it below 10, and even just one below 10 to 9 starts crushing things together. There's a huge loss of variety for those dark shades. Things look quite cinematic. It's basically as if you've just bumped up the gamma massively. So again, you can adjust this according to your preference if you want to. I much prefer the neutral position of 10. And if you do want a competitive edge, I'd recommend experimenting with some of the gamma settings first because that way you retain strong contrast as well. Whereas increasing this beyond 10 will start ebbing away at your contrast. Next is super resolution. This is a sharpness filter, a sharpness enhancement function. You can set this to one, two, three, or four with an ever stronger sharpness effect. You can't really see it properly on the video, but four is extremely over sharpened. Looks really artificial and weird. What I would say though, is that using a setting of one can be quite useful if you're running the monitor at a non-native resolution, so full HD. And I talk a bit about that in the written review in the interpolation and upscaling section. Next is display mode. And these aren't all available if you've got AMD FreeSync active. So if you've got AMD FreeSync Premium Pro active in the OSD, then you'll only be able to select full and aspect. So the first ones, full and aspect, they're applicable when you're running the monitor at a non-native resolution. So I'm just going to switch over to the full HD resolution. And if you notice any lines anywhere in this video, you can see them quite clearly, or I can see them quite clearly on my camera's preview display. That's just more away from the camera. It isn't observed on the screen itself, so don't worry about that. It's just because I've got the camera fairly close to the monitor at the moment. So the full setting, that will use all of the pixels. The monitor is using an interpolation process to fill out the pixels with the full HD resolution, but it's using all 2560 by 1440 pixels on the display. The aspect setting next, that's exactly the same if you've got a resolution at 16 by 9, but what this will do is it will maintain the aspect ratio, the correct aspect ratio, so things aren't distorted in that respect but it will use as many pixels as it can whilst doing that. Next is one-to-one. -one. So that's a one-to-one -one pixel mapping feature. So it's only using 1920 by 1080 pixels at the moment, and the rest is a black border around the screen. The remaining options basically simulate various different screen sizes and aspect ratios. I'm running the native resolution at the moment as well, 2560 by 1440, just so you know. So 22 inch wide, 16 by 10. 23 inch wide, 16 by 9. 23.6 inch wide, 16 by 9. And finally, 24 inch, 16 by 9. Next, you've got overdrive, and I prefer the balance setting. This is all explored in the review. And next, I've already shown you this, but you can activate AMD FreeSync Premium Pro, or more specifically, it activates Adaptive Sync and allows you to use AMD FreeSync or NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode, depending on your GPU. Next is picture. So these are the presets of the monitor. Every preset gives you full functionality with the exception of sRGB, which I'll come on to shortly, but they just set things to various different values. So I'm not gonna to spend too long going through these. Standard is just fairly bright, reasonably well balanced overall. FPS looks quite bright and flooded. You can see that the sharpness has been increased. The gamma is set to gamma one, which is too low. So that's really for a competitive edge. So again, you get more visibility and it makes a few other changes, I believe as well, because the color balance looks a little bit off. Now the color temperature is actually set to normal, but it just um, was a little bit off compared to the settings I was using before, I should say. RTS RPG, so you can see that has gamma mode two, sharpness set to six. Things look richer than they do under the FPS setting. But again, these are just things you can adjust yourself. You can adjust all of this yourself according to preferences. Movie, that has gamma 4, sharpness 6, so it's a bit over sharpened. Looks quite cinematic, which is appropriate. So on my unit, gamma 4 is a bit high, so it's I think it's 2.4. There's reader, and this reduces the contrast slightly, and it basically makes things look just a little bit washed out, really. Perhaps more relaxing on the eyes, you know, some people might like reading with this setting on, which is why it exists. But it's not as extreme as Samsung's eye saver mode, which reduces contrast massively. 
with that kind of thing in mind, but I don't care for this kind of setting myself. SRGB is an sRGB emulation mode, so you'll see a lot of this is greyed out now. You can adjust the brightness though, and this setting is explored in more detail in the written review. Custom 1, Custom 2 and Custom 3, they're just another set of fully customizable presets. The only thing to be aware of is the colour channels when you adjust them. So that's under colour temperature, user define. If you make changes here, as I've done now, they're applied universally every time you use user define on any of the other presets. So it won't save any changes you've made to just this preset for the colour temperature settings for the red, green and blue colour channels. However, you'll see there it says save settings. So there is an option to save everything and then quickly recall them. So there's three different sets of settings. You can save everything, including your individual color channel adjustments, and then recall them later if you'd like to. And bear in mind, you can have user define on one of your presets and then various other color temperature settings other than user define on other ones, low blue light settings, that kind of thing all work fine. So that doesn't overwrite your user define settings. Don't worry about that. So you'll see there are various different options with each of these presets. Brightness, contrast, colour vibrance. So this is a digital saturation enhancement. Increasing this beyond 10 will pull shades closer to the edge of the gamut without expanding the gamut itself. So you're essentially losing shade variety, but you're getting an increase in saturation. So things look really very cartoonish, very blended together. This is obviously an extreme example. I've got this set all the way up to 20 now, but things look very wrong indeed but very fiery, very vivid. So you can adjust this according to preferences if you'd like, but I find even adjusting this just slightly up to up to 11 does reduce the shade variety and makes things look quite unnatural. This monitor has a wide gamut as it is, so I don't really think this is necessary, but some people might actually like to reduce this slightly to take a bit of edge off the saturation. But again, I find it hard to get the balance right. So even with a setting of nine, I find that some shades appear too undersaturated. So some of the oranges and reds, for example, PowerPoint, and some of the greens as well, they just look a little bit undersaturated. Whereas some other shades have quite intense saturation. Golden colors, for example, some of the cyans look a bit oversaturated still. So tricky to get the balance right, but you can adjust that according to your own preferences. Another thing to adjust according to your own preferences is sharpness. I'm quite happy with the neutral position of five, but you can increase that or decrease that according to your own preferences. And again, this may come into play more if you're looking at lower resolution content or you're using the monitor at a non-native resolution. Next is gamma. Six different gamma settings. Off, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, gamma four, gamma five, all explored in the calibration section of the written review. Color temperature. You can set this to cool, which is cool. And that doesn't mean cool as in awesome or great or anything like that. It means cool as in the color temperature is high, higher than it should be, beyond 6,500K. Normal, which is the factory default setting. Warm, which is something I quite like to use. This is actually a low blue light setting. It very effectively reduces the blue light output from the monitor. It is a very effective low blue light setting. And I use this for my own viewing comfort in the evenings with a reduction in brightness. And I actually save this to my custom two preset. So it's very easy to switch between custom one, which is my test settings and custom two, which are my preferred relaxing evening viewing settings. And then there's user define, which I showed you before, where you can manually adjust the red, green, and blue color channels. There's also a low blue light setting and you can set this between one and 10 or zero, which is off. 10 is the strongest effect. This is an alternative low blue light setting. I prefer the warm setting because this low blue light setting maintains a relatively strong green channel. So there's a bit of a green tint to the image. It isn't extreme, as isn't extreme as I've seen on some models, but it is there and your eyes adjust to it only to some extent. They don't fully adjust. And I prefer the balance with the warm setting. The warm setting is still very effective. Again, this is explored in the calibration section of the written review. Next, you've got dynamic contrast, and you can set this between one and five. Increasing this further just increases the gamma, so it's very high indeed at the moment. One, even one actually gives you quite an increase in gamma compared to the factory default, but it also applies a dynamic contrast effect, which allows the backlight to adjust as an individual unit according to the content on the screen. And this is explored in the contrast section of the written review. Again, not really a setting I like to use, but 
Not the worst implementation of this sort I've seen. Sensei Demo, which actually seems broken on this model, but what this is supposed to do is it's supposed to give you half of the screen showing the settings you were using before you activated the setting, and then the other half showing any adjustments you've made after you've enabled the Sensei Demo setting. I've used this on the FI27 QP and it worked just fine, and it did what it should be doing. On this model it doesn't seem to work properly, so if I change to, say, sRGB or Reader, let's, let's go for something really obvious, FPS. That actually changes the right and left side of the screen, so it isn't showing what I had before on one side and the new settings on the other. It just kind of hybridizes everything and it's very odd. And then there's Reset Picture, which will just reset this particular preset to the factory defaults for that preset. You've then got Display, so you can change the input used by the monitor. HDMI, RGB, PC range, that's greyed out unless you're actually using HDMI. That would allow you to select full or limited range for the signal. Overscan, which is also greyed out unless you're using a system where that would apply, and that might be an older games console or something like that. But for most systems, including modern games consoles, PCs, this setting is completely irrelevant. PIP, P by P, picture and picture, picture by picture. So you can have part of the screen show your main source and the other part of the screen showing your subsource. So if I had something connected to HDMI for another system, I could have that displaying up there in that box. So you can change the source used in the box versus the rest of the screen. PIP size, so what I was showing you before is small, but you can have that set to medium, or you can have that set to large. You can change the location, so you can have it top left, top right, bottom left, or bottom right. I know it says left top, right top, left bottom, right bottom, but I don't say things that way, so I'm sorry if I confused you there. Display switch, so that'll just switch around the main source and the subsource. Audio switch, which will allow you to choose the audio coming from either the main source or the subsource. Next is PBP, picture by picture. Same kind of options here, but this will give you half of the screen with one source, your primary source, and the other half with your secondary source. And you can see it's all squished up and weird. It will be less squished up and less weird depending on the resolution you're using, but this is just with the native resolution, so it's only showing the native resolution on half of the screen, so obviously it has to compress things. I think most people probably would prefer picture in picture, just generally, because of the way that most resolutions are shown in quite a weird way with P by P. It's only two-way P by P. If it was four-way, you'd have four different things and it wouldn't be sort of compressed like this. So that could work better, but it's only two-way P by P, which to be fair is very common on monitors. It's not very common to have four-way P by P. There are some exceptions. So again, similar options there. Source, PBP size. So you can have it set to full or aspect. So with the aspect setting, it doesn't crush it up like I was showing you before, but everything's a lot smaller. So at least it doesn't have it distorted. So that could be quite useful, I suppose. But Still, in terms of maximizing the screen space, I think most people are probably going to prefer PIP, but you'll know which you prefer by just experimenting yourself. And again, there's display switch, which switches the sources around. And audio switch, which switches the audio source around. So either the left source or the right source, the left side of the screen, the right side of the screen for your audio. And for some reason, it's showing it on both the left and right sides at the moment. I'm not sure exactly why that is, but it's very disconcerting. But hopefully when I select off, it'll all go back to normal again. Yep, lovely. You've then got system. You can change the audio settings, so the volume of anything connected to the 3.5mm jack. So note that this monitor does not have integrated speakers. Or you can mute anything connected to the 3.5mm jack. OSD settings, so you can change how long the OSD is displayed before automatically collapsing in on itself. Or if you press exit, so left a few times, it will go away as well. You can do that manually. OSD transparency level, 0%, 20, 40, 60, or 80%. OSD lock. So if you enable that, you'll now notice that it says the button is locked, 
Confirm to unlock OSD. Okay, so that's quite straightforward. On some models, I think usually ASUS ones, it's a bit less obvious how you unlock the OSD, and I have people always asking on my videos, how do you unlock the OSD? And it, I have to say it gets quite tiresome. People continuously asking the same question over and over, but this one's very self-explanatory. The button is locked, confirm to unlock OSD, yes, and then it's unlocked and you can use it as normal. You've then got quick switch, which I mentioned before, so you can select what happens when you twiddle the joystick up, down, left, or right before entering the main menu system. So you can have the aim stabilizer, black equalizer, low blue light, volume, input, contrast, brightness, and picture mode. So let's select brightness, low blue light, not aim stabilizer because I don't want the screen to flicker again. That can be a bit annoying. Picture mode and left whatever left was by default. I can't really remember. So you can now see, yep, left was volume. Up now allows me to quickly control the brightness. Right allows me to change the picture mode very quickly. And down allows me to change the low blue light filter. So it's good flexibility there. Other settings. You can change the resolution notice. So this just gives you a little message on the screen if you're running a non-native resolution to tell you what your resolution is. If you don't want it to display that every time you're switching to a non-native resolution, then turn that off. Input auto switch. So this allows the monitor to automatically select the input that's used. If you want to manually select it, then you just have this turned off. Auto power off. So you can have that set to 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or 30 minutes. DisplayPort version. So for the full capability, you want 1.2 plus HDR, but for compatibility purposes for older GPUs, you can have the 1.1 if you need to use that. You can change the language the OSD is displayed in. Save settings, I showed you that just before. You can save to three different sets of settings and reset all. So resets everything to the factory defaults. I'm now going to look at the OSD Sidekick software. So you can download that from Gigabyte's website. There's a link in the description of the video. And this allows you to control the OSD using software and use some of the functionality I talked about earlier. So one of the things I mentioned was that dashboard feature. I'll come on to that very shortly because you can enable it very easily through here, or you can just do it with the joystick, which because of where I've got the camera is a real stretch at the moment. But if you press the joystick in, and then you press the joystick left, you can activate the dashboard feature like that. So I'll just do that now. You can see that the various different things you can have selected here. And I'm sorry that I sound a bit weird now, it's because I'm having to stretch really far at the moment. So you can select or unselect these different settings depending on what you actually want it to show. And you can change the dashboard location. So you can have it top left, top right, bottom left or bottom right. So it should very shortly populate with various different stats. So you do need to have the OSD Sidekick software open for this to actually populate. And it does take a little while to actually communicate and get these different things. It doesn't seem to be doing it at the moment, but hopefully it'll do it very shortly. Otherwise, this is going to be a very long video. It's already a long video. I've noticed this actually before, so it's still not populating. I've had this issue before. It's a bit temperamental. Sometimes it just doesn't populate for some reason. So I'm just going to restart the software. And hopefully this will populate this time. Yep, yeah, there we go. It took a while, but you can see that it gives you some of these stats. It doesn't have all of them. It depends what it can read and what it can't read from the sensors and the computer. The Aorus Mouse DPI, for example, I don't have an Aorus Mouse, so that setting isn't shown there. But you can see it says things like the GPU temperature, that kind of thing, but you get the idea. That's what that's for. Another thing to be aware of is that you do need to have the USB upstream cable connected to the monitor to use OSD Sidekick software. Now, one thing I don't actually like about this software, there's just a slight issue I have with it, is that you can see it has a strange transparency effect. Things are a bit kind of faded out almost. I think it makes things look a bit less clear than they should be. Once they're highlighted, it's very clear, but the things that aren't highlighted look quite subdued. 
and blend in a bit too well and it just makes it a bit harder to read and it's just kind of unnecessary for usability. Um, I'm not sure if I'm missing a setting here to change that but there doesn't seem to be anything. But anyway, the main functionality is there, so you've got your different presets here. You'll notice it doesn't have custom 1, custom 2 and custom 3. It just has the other presets listed. Although this is currently changing my custom 1 because that's what I had selected. So if you don't select another thing here, then it's going to be allowing you to customise your settings for custom 1, custom 2 or custom 3, if you have that selected anyway. So you can change the brightness. You can change the contrast, all sorts of different settings here, you can see them, or hopefully you can see them in the video. There's also something eSports Customize, and what this does is it allows you to set all of these things up and then save them as a profile, and you can name the profile whatever you want, and then you can later load that in using the OSD Sidekick software, or you can transfer it to another system. So if you have a friend um, who wants to set things up in the same way you have, or you've got another monitor that you want to set up in the same way, this can be very useful for that. Another gigabyte monitor that supports this software. So I'll add a profile, yeah, user six, that'll do. So it's now saved all of this as user six. And then you press that little arrow there, that's how you get back to the other settings. So you'll see that user six is there again. And you can have various other ones. You don't just have to have one set of settings. You can at least save a decent number of them, I believe. So the crosshair functionality here, if you remember, that was a standard one, that little green crosshair. But you can save three different crosshair designs. So these are your custom crosshair designs. You press the little pen icon. You can then draw your own thing. You can choose the color. You have to have the whole thing in one colour, you can't change the colour part way through. But this tool can be a little bit tricky to use, I don't know what I'm creating here, some kind of strange pink strawberry it looks like. Um, but then you press save. You can also import them and export them if you want to get them onto another monitor, or something like that. So it says upload. And then you can just exit this and it's got my little crosshair there so you can see the design is actually a lot smaller than it appears when I was creating it. You get the idea. So that's been saved as one. Two and three is just the defaults but I could create another one for two and three if I want. Hotkeys, these are quite useful. So I've actually set some of these up. I don't really use them myself but I can see the utility. For example, you can quickly change the brightness, black equalizer setting, the counter, which I was talking about before, so if you want to press a certain key or combination of keys, so Alt, Shift or Control and then something else, it will count up or count down. So quite a few different things. You can set the overdrive as well. I mean, you can read them yourself or pause the video and have a read of them. There are some extras here as well. You can add more features if you want. Super resolution is another one you can increase and decrease. That could be potentially useful if you're frequently changing between native and non-native resolutions and you want to quickly activate or deactivate that setting. You can switch between picture modes very quickly. Sharpness levels, colour vibrance, all sorts of things. So it's quite useful. So you've got brightness is control and minus and plus is control and equals. So if you get off this, you don't need to be having the software active in the window. You can be on any other application. So press control and equals which is also a plus on the key, so it makes sense for me. Or control and minus to lower the brightness. And it does it in increments of five each time you press once, so it gives you a reasonable amount of adjustability. But it's still reacting to my key press because I pressed them a lot in rapid succession and there is a little bit of lag, so just be careful when you're doing this because it can be a little bit laggy and it seems to be still adjusting brightness on its own and I'm not pressing anything, so I think I've utterly confused it here. So it seems to have stopped at 56, but I'm going to set that back to 34 because that's my preferred setting. So when it's minimised, it goes into the system tray, so you can quickly open OSD Sidekick, get it back up again. Next is general setting. 
So you can change the input. OSD transparency, this changes the transparency of the OSD, but it does nothing to change the transparency of this software, which is a little bit annoying, as I mentioned before. OSD display time, which I've gone through, you can set that between five seconds and 30 seconds in increments of five seconds, in case I didn't mention that before. I don't think I did. So I think it's a little bit harsh. I mean, most people will be able to do what they want in 30 seconds, but when you're creating videos of OSD settings and you need to talk through things, sometimes can be more useful to have a little bit longer than 30 seconds, but never mind. It's just me being fussy. You can change the resolution used by the monitor, the frequency, the refresh rate, And you can change what the quick switch does. So there is a lot of functionality on this OSD Sidekick software. It's, it's quite good actually, being able to access a lot of different features. And another thing which can be very useful is the ability to update the firmware. So it gives you the latest firmware version available from Gigabyte and your current firmware version. So you can see mine's F09 for both of these because I've got the latest one installed. And if that last version is newer than your firmware version, you just press download and it will download the firmware for you and you can then update it. And it's all an automatic process. It'll do everything itself. So it's really very easy to do. And you can do the same with the Sidekick software itself. For some reason, it looks like mine is newer than the last version. So the build date is newer than that. Um, that's a bit odd, I'm not sure what's going on there, but I did download this very recently from Gigabyte's website, so I'd assume it should be the latest version I'm using. You can have it automatically update for you if you want, automatically update the OSD Sidekick software. It won't automatically update the firmware for you if you select this. That's just for the OSD Sidekick software, because that could be very dodgy. You have to make sure that whilst you're updating the firmware, you don't turn the monitor off or you don't suddenly turn your system off or anything like that. So you do have to be a bit careful when you're doing that. But that's really all there is to the OSD Sidekick software. And indeed, all there is to the rather comprehensive OSD on-screen display menu system of the Gigabyte G32QC. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.